Okay, very good morning to you. It is Friday, 19th of November. Hope you are doing well. And in terms of the briefing, even though it's a Friday, tons of stuff for me to cover, of course. So I'll try to keep it as on point as possible. But obviously, we had a really topsy-turvy day on Wall Street yesterday. Initial selling at the open or some hawkish Fed comments and then a flip reversal. And I'll explain why that happened. And we actually closed at record highs in the S&P and the NASDAQ. And funny enough, if you subscribe to the Market Maker daily newsletter that I put out, if you want to, you can just find it on amplifyme.com at the bottom of the web page. But I wrote that yesterday at around the open because I had some meetings for the rest of the day and I was talking about the catalysts and the reasons why it would come lower. There was also some negative type political comments on the, the new bill, Build Back Better bill they're trying to push in the US as well. And then lo and behold, I checked back in uh, after market and we finished at a record high. So standard fare, I would say, as far as markets are concerned in 2021. And as you can see here from this graphic that I've got up on my screen at the moment, the S&P 500, in fact, is poised for the second biggest number of all time highs um, ever uh, in a year. And as you can see here, this would would have to go back to really the mid 90s, the last time we'd seen so many record highs in just one singular uh, year. But we'll get into that in a moment. I'm also going to talk about the latest change of a US investment bank on bringing forward their rate hike expectations for the Fed, that being JP Morgan. We've got COVID update. We've just had a breaking headline come out. Austria are going to make even more aggressive uh, lockdown and they're going to implement that from Monday given the outbreak that they're seeing of COVID at the moment. But this is being seen now in Germany, Greece, um, Slovakia, the US in Chicago, the UK numbers are going back up. So we'll have a bit of a COVID update. Uh, Bitcoin's down for a fifth consecutive day. We're now trading the futures market at 56,000 handle. Um, and technicians would say that we've got a little perhaps further to go um, in that price point. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, US politics and then a look ahead for the day. We've already had UK retail sales come out. Uh, no real market impact on sterling, albeit the numbers were just a touch better than expected, came in at 0.8% month to month for October against 0.5% expected. But yeah, quick look at the charts before I go into those headline stories. And the dollar is a little bit firmer this morning. It's just kind of popped up a little bit as UK European players have stepped into the market. So we're up around two tenths of 1% in a dollar index. And that's just pushed um, euro out of a, a really quiet phase of consolidation through much of the uh, main part of the Asia pack session. So a bit of a breakdown in price if we drifted down to the S1, uh, whereas sterling perhaps um, not quite as deep in negative territory, just given those aforementioned retail sales, maybe just providing some very short term support. Otherwise, in equity index futures, uh, the S&P NASDAQ very quiet, holding on to generally a positive handover from the US to Asia. And we've just kind of sat sideways at the R1 in the futures at around this record high territory. The DAX, though, just having a bit of rejection around the R1 and just dipping back down in quick fashion through the cash open down to pivot. Oil just holding on uh, to the gains that we've seen yesterday following some of the downside pressure that we've had. Um, throughout uh, recent trading sessions. So we're back to a 79 handle at the moment. Uh, just looking here on some of the technical setup, three tests on that trend line through the price recovery. So at around 78.83, I'd be looking at and watching for some support. And you can see psychologically finding some short term at so 79 mark. T notes pretty quiet as is gold. So let's get straight into some of these headlines. Um, and as I said, the, the NASDAQ 100. Um, was a big outperformer yesterday. The chip maker NVIDIA actually finished up in excess of 8%. Um, they boosted their outlook. Uh, Apple were up just shy of 3%. Uh, they also jumped after a Bloomberg News article reported the company is pushing to accelerate um, their development of the electric car. Um, even though Apple have stumbled at every step almost in their quest in the EV market, the EV boom is in vogue right now, as we've seen from Rivian um, and other uh, car makers uh, coming in Lucid this week. The recent SPAC deal have just gone meteoric in terms of their share price. And so, yeah, the EV space is really, you know, you just mention it and all of a sudden your stock gets a little pump. So Apple recipient somewhat of that yesterday. Uh, Amazon were up a decent amount. And then Macy's and Kohl's were up 21 and 11% each respectively. So big gains uh, in the retailers, they signal consumer demand remains robust. And that's a really positive thing, of course, because at the moment, inflation is super high, 31 year high in the US and yet consumers 
are still spending. Uh, and that's a really a, a quite opposite view of which I guess the market would come to think for some of those retail names. And in an actuality, just making the, the S&P chart a little bit bigger, I mean, it was such a seesaw day. It was kind of classic day. I, I did a tweet last night in La La Land, which is <laughs> we sell off. Uh, there, and the reason, the rationale for this initial portion of the sell off which if I just put a circle, which is here, was at the cash open at around the similar timing to that. You had some comments out of the New York Federal Reserve Bank President John Williams. And John Williams, um, whoever's the head of the, the New York Fed, is always an influential person. Uh, Williams tends to sit center ground, fairly aligned with Powell, if not leaning perhaps on the slight dovish side. And he came out and basically said inflation is becoming more broad based and the expectations for future price increases are rising. Now, what he's saying, I don't think is particularly new. We've seen from the last inflation report, yes, indeed, although there's still these kind of transitory uh, factors uh, that we could account for, like energy or used cars and trucks, um, things like shelter and other areas would degree, would suggest a degree of um, broadening out of inflationary pressures. But it's more just the fact that he's saying it. That kind of ratifies it that the Fed are looking at it. So it's a little bit of a hawkish comment from a kind of centre-leaning, dovish person. And the market didn't like it, obviously, um, because it kind of buys into this narrative that more market pricing aggressively for, for nearer rate hikes. And then, obviously, as I mentioned, you kind of had a really string of just positive news. Uh, the chip makers, the big tech, the retailers, and we just soldiered on. I mean, it didn't take long. We reversed the entire move pretty much within two hours of the opening bell sell-off. And then we, we rallied. We pretty much finished at record highs here. And then Asia's come in, bumped it up again uh, in overnight trades. So we're right up here at these most elevated levels now. And um, here's back on a, a daily continuation chart to just tell a bit more of a story. And so... Um, you can see here this uh, top end of what was a channel, now trend line here, resistance, the market kind of responding to that back in uh, the early part of November. So one would say, and if we've broken out now of that 5th of November high here, looking at the S&P futures, then, well, next kind of upside target might not come until we get further up here, another 40 points above where we are at the moment. So, yeah, a, a, as aggressive as this rally has been, could there be more record highs to put us in check with some of that uh, the tables I've been showing you for the second biggest number of all-time highs. Is it gunning for the mid-90s highs? It sure is. So let's see how it plays out. That's not to say that it's going to be plain sailing. Um, before I move on, just very quickly, if I may, don't forget, I'm going to have a chat with the head of trading, Piers Curran, Amplify co-founder, of course, and he and I have a bit of a uh, end of week chin wag where we talk about some of the key things in markets uh, and for sure we'll talk about some of this ev move that we've been seeing and some of those stock names uh, in the equity space uh, amongst other things so do check it out um, just search for amplify me market maker on spotify uh, google Podcasts, apple and so on all right one of the banks that has actually changed their rate call um, is jp morgan comes on the coattail of, of of others that we've seen like goldman's and so on uh, but JP Morgan analysts have said they now expect the Fed to raise rates next September, becoming the kind of latest Wall Street bank to change their forecast, which they previously saw the Fed on hold through next year, 2022. Um, on Thursday, one of the other things we did see, and it kind of fits then in step with what we had from Williams, was uh, Charles Evans, who's one of the US central bank's most kind of reliable policy doves or perceived to be. And he said he is more, quote, open-minded um, to raising interest rates next year than he was six months ago. So again, this is the, the, the kind of subtlety of the nuance of language. I mean, it sounds fairly insignificant, but it's a meaningful thing. And when you start to hear the collective changing, uh, typically those of a more dovish disposition, then you know definitely the, the Fed are starting to tilt towards being more hawkish. Um, the other thing that JP Morgan said that perhaps was interesting, their economists believe Jerome Powell will win the nomination for the Fed chair for another four years from Biden. Remember, sources early in the week were saying about a four day period into that announcement. And that four day period would lapse pretty much by the end of today going into Saturday. So 
potentially an announcement over the weekend. Um, the latest is that Powell has public backing from a number of Democratic and Republican senators, including a majority of Republicans on the Banking Committee and key moderate Democrat John Tester of Montana, according to latest reports, albeit Joe Manchin, who's been the headache on passage from the Democrats on the Senate for the Build Back Better bill, um, he's also said to be requested meetings of both Brainard and Powell later today. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Again, I'm still leaning on Powell at this point in terms of my expectation. Okay, moving over to COVID. Yeah, it's been um, quite... This hasn't been a new thing. Um, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and things like that this week, and we obviously had a big week in terms of uh, euro weakness overall, and that's come as the policy divergence. I've just been talking about the Fed doves shifting gradually to becoming more hawkish against then the remaining static, if you like, ECB, who are nowhere near the opportunity of doing such measures at this point. And there's going to be a bit of a disconnect between them. The timings, of course, between the Bank of England. We've had data out of the UK recently that would suggest actually the furlough impact was more marginal. Inflation is moving quicker on the upside. Do they hike possibly then in December? The Fed now sounding hawkish, but the ECB static. And if anything, in Europe, things are going worse at this point in time, and chiefly because of COVID. Uh, and it's concerning because, of course, the time of year and so on and so forth. But we've just had some breaking news out of Austria. And to give you a bit of context before I run through these headlines, um, this hasn't updated yet. Um, so these numbers are, uh, are kind of 24 hours old, but the patterns remain true. And Austria has been the absolute outbreak here of daily new confirmed cases per million on a seven-day rolling basis, followed by the Netherlands. The UK is seeing a bit of an uptick. Uh, this doesn't account for yesterday's meaningful uptick that we saw um, as well, which was actually um, the most in a month in the last 24-hour period for the UK after that good run. Germany obviously heading up, as is the US, as is France at the moment. So um, yeah, not looking terribly good. But Austria have come out and they've said they're going to go into a hard lockdown as of Monday. Um, it will be a 20-day lockdown for everyone, including those who are vaccinated, which will then continue for just the unvaccinated, because there's a big political dispute at the moment how certain European countries are handling, or the NHS is handling in the UK, about people and their jobs and who gets locked down, whether they're vaccinated or not. Um, obviously a real contentious issue on, on the, for the politicians to handle. But on the, on the other countries, Germany, we know, has been uh, making noises about this. They've been a little bit indecisive because of the, the formation of the coalition is yet to really be dis, uh, decisive enough, I, I guess, to, to make uh, a quick decision. But they're applying pressure on citizens to get COVID-19 shots. They're announcing plans to restrict many leisure activities for unvaccinated in almost the entire country. Uh, in the European space, Greece has expanded restrictions for unvaccinated. Czech Republic, Slovakia have imposed extended bans. The Netherlands resumed a partial lockdown last week. Uh, Austria, they're also using police checks to deter people from breaching their vaccine requirements as well. So, you know, things are getting serious pretty quickly here. Um, meanwhile, in the UK, as I, as I briefly men mentioned, you know, I was talking earlier two weeks ago about, or even a week ago, about the fact that the UK was looking quite good in a sense that we'd had a consecutive run of declining cases, um, but that now has ended. And actually, the UK has recorded more than 46,000 cases of coronavirus in the last 24 hours, and that's the highest number in a month. Uh, so it's quickly kind of changing direction. Um, a total of 277,261 cases were reported in the past seven days. For context, context, that's equivalent of around 14.5% rise that we've had um, over that period of a week. And then the other one is in, in the US. Now, um, obviously, it would take me a long time to deconstruct the entire landscape of America because COVID is very much more, uh, there's a big difference between given how expansive and the different temperatures and climate and how densely populated these areas are in America. 
Um, but Chicago is one that's just been flagged as they're facing their latest surge of COVID cases ahead of the holiday season, which obviously is quite concerning uh, as we've got things like Thanksgiving and you definitely don't want to be going into Thanksgiving um, with case ri- cases already rising because one would imagine that post that event, certainly if anything, last year was anything to go on, those cases are going to spike higher again. And for Chicago, yeah, their, their daily cases are up about 18% from the previous week. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the problem you have with Thanksgiving, of course, is that if there is freedom of movement, um, then if cases are spiking on a 20% incline over a weekly period then and, and rising, and then we get into Thanksgiving and people start to disperse to see their family around the country, you can see quite quickly how this starts to become quite problematic. Uh, so yeah, that's the COVID situation. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin um, has drawn a bit more attention. I mean, look, I'm going to bring up the chart fresh. I haven't actually got it prepared, marked up with any technicals, but just for the conversation piece, you can see after we hit that that run up, you know, we had a, such a solid gain really through this period of um, October. There was all that talk at the time about the ETF launches. Uh, Valkyrie, ProShares, and so on. There's been, you know, just a huge amount of interest in, in the kind of the combination of the ecosystem, if you like, of the metaverse and decentralized finance all coming together, and that's what really prompted the big rise we had in Bitcoin. And now we're just seeing a bit of that come out, really. And and after hitting near seventy thousand, we've now traded down as much as sub fifty six thousand in the futures. I'm looking at here in in, in Bitcoin. Um, one thing I did see a few people talking about was a fib retracement. I haven't actually marked this up, so let's do it together now while we're on the on the session. So taking that low point from the summer, which was a huge technical level, of course, that we were looking at at the time, 30K psychologically, you had the lows from early 2021, you had the test in June, failed to break, and then you had that bounce. So definitely a big uh, level down there, but that seems a great distance from where we're at at the moment. So yeah, if you put the fib on here on the daily, on, I mean, and again, I'm looking at the futures chart. Um, you would say potentially from a technical perspective, um, of course, technicals play quite a strong degree uh, of how price action tends to react amongst well, obviously fundamentals as well in the crypto space. But although we've bounced a little bit from recent lows, um, you can see that fib doesn't really start to come in until the 382, if until we get lower to really around the 54,000 level. Um, and so perhaps there's a little bit more further to run at this point in time. And then you've got 53 would be that initial peak we had on the 7th of September as well. Uh, so yeah, I'm still interested. And obviously, this isn't a Bitcoin only move. It's been fairly um, uniform across the, the space uh, as well. But uh, perhaps from a technical perspective, looking at things like Ethereum, not too unsurprising to see a little bit of a breather after the, the pretty sharp rise that it had seen. I don't think most people who are who are holders are particularly panicked by this sell-off, uh, but certainly short-term, more speculative, perhaps retail money in that sense might be might be just exacerbated some of the short-term price movement. But uh, the people I speak to, uh, some of the research that I read would suggest that more kind of long-term, medium-term holders, what I'd classify as more uh, six, nine months, twelve months and beyond, that they're, they're not panicked at all by this this latest. Uh, pull back but yeah we'll see um going back to the news the other things then that we've had i've already um i think briefly mentioned this but just to give you the details the vote on the u.s president's 1.75 trillion social spending bill has been delayed until um, friday in the house of representatives the vote was originally scheduled for last night because politicians wanted to wait for the cbo um, the Congressional Budget Office to come forward with their assessment of what this bill would mean for the economy over the long term. And essentially their findings said that it's going to add quite a lot to the deficit over that uh, decade period. In fact, around $367 billion to the deficit. Um, but their analysis did not include any revenue generated by additional financing through tax enforcement. Nonetheless, the CBO reports probably enough then for politicians to start push to push back on the progression of this bill, I would have thought, even though uh, in a technical sense, uh, that figure that they'll be saying is not really true if it doesn't really account for tax enforcement, which you would imagine would be the case. So again, such as politics, it's just the latest thing. I don't think it's too meaningful, to be honest. But 
yeah, will they vote today? Perhaps. Will it get delayed? Perhaps. Does it mean a lot for markets? Not really, I'd say. Um, but time is, is ticking on, on this matter. Um, and a similar thing can be said for Brexit. And so the European Commission Vice President um, Sevkovic and the UK Brexit Minister David Frost, they're going to be meeting in Brussels later on today as they do to turn a, take stock of their week of intensive talks that they've had. And it's going to be focused on easing the flow of medicines between Britain and Northern Ireland along a broader range of customs and food inspection uh, issues. A deal on medicines, according to analysts, and it's being reported in Bloomberg, would give fresh impetus to wider talks and temper fears that the UK might imminently just end all negotiations and the retaliation effect from the EU if Article 16 um, is invoked. And so this isn't kind of the silver bullet. This is the deal that does the whole Northern Ireland Protocol done. It's just one thing, let's say, that then just keeps them at the table and averts the worst case scenario is the way I'd think about it. Um, so something to be aware of, they're speaking today. Um, Frost was speaking at the House of Lords yesterday and he did acknowledge that the European Courts of Justice would continue to have a role in interpreting EU law in the region. And that's a huge contrast to the remarks he made less than a month ago. Remember, he was pretty stern saying if the ECJ is still involved in any kind of final decisions that happen in regard to the border with Northern Ireland, um, then that's their red line. And now he's softening on that. So, again, it's the usual Brexit merry-go-round. They go aggressive, they come off, they go again, they posture. It's quite frankly, it's just... <laughs> Uh, it's quite tiring at this point. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's particularly meaningful as far as markets are concerned. Very short term in an intraday basis, but that's your latest. All right, for the session ahead, we've already had the UK, UK retail sales. It's pretty quiet this morning. The whole day, in fact, from a data perspective, is is pretty dull. Um, you've got CAD retail sales this afternoon. Christine Lagarde, the ECB president, to speak this morning, uh, talking on a speech entitled Recovery to Strength. Uh, that'll be at 8.30 and 6 p.m. And then you've got the uh, equity index option expiries happening throughout the day, UK, Europe, uh, and the US as well. So just to be aware of. So final thing, don't forget, check out the podcast. Please subscribe, follow, um, leave a rating if you like it. And uh, yeah, new episode coming out. But hope you've had a good week and I will see you on Monday. Take care.